Uh, my, name, my name is Xiang Wen Mao. I'm an assistant professor of material science of engineering here at NUS. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's seminar. And uh, we are very delighted to have Professor Jay Hong Kim joining us today as today's speaker. And Jay Hong uh, is a Henry P. Batten Senior Professor of Engineering and Department Chair of Chemical and Environmental Engineering in the School of Engineering and Applied Science at Yale University. Professor Kim received his bachelor and a master degrees in chemical and biological engineering from Seoul National University, and later obtained a PhD in environmental engineering from UIUC. And later he joined the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Georgia Tech. And later he held the title of Georgia's Power Distinguished Professor there. Then in 2013, Professor Kim moved to Yale University as a Barton Weller Endowed Professor. He is a recipient of various awards. Uh, I will mention a few recent ones, uh, such as Ackman Award for Teaching and Mentoring from Yale University, and the Walter Huber Civil Engineering Research Prize from American Society of Civil Engineers, and also Top Environmental Technology Paper Award from American Chemical Society. So Professor Kim is known for his work throughout his career on designing nanomaterials and uh, using nanomaterials for environmental applications. But most recently, he's doing something very exciting, some very interesting work on single atom catalysis for water treatment, which he will tell us about today. And I think this is a topic of very general interest to material scientists, chemical engineers, environmental engineers, and chemists. So we are very looking forward to his talk. Uh, let's welcome Professor Jae Hong Kim. And Jae Hong, the screen is yours. All right, and thank you very much, uh, for um, Xiaowen, for a nice introduction. And I'm glad to uh, uh, present uh, my recent work to uh, students and colleagues at NUS. This is my fourth visit to Singapore, and each time I just really love to be here for various reasons. Um, I gave a talk uh, many years ago in uh, NUS too, but it was in civil and environmental engineering. And this time, um, glad to get connected to um, colleagues in other universities, other departments. So the title of my presentation is Toward Single Atom Catalyst for Environmental Application. Uh, but I just want to spend a few minutes talking about my other research area because you know, uh, I'm, I was just keep telling uh, Sean Wen that I'm not a mature scientist. I'm an environmental engineer who is trying to apply uh, many interests in science to solve water problems. Uh, my major interest is uh, killing germs in water and destroying pollutants uh, because that's a, a public health concern. And uh, um, over the past many years, I've been trying to maintain a few different subject areas. Uh, one reason is because uh, when I step into new research area, it's always fun to study something new. But another reason is because you never know which one get, will get funded. So, you know, for especially faculty in the States, we have to continuously uh, seek for new ideas uh, to secure funding. I'm not sure about the Singapore, but at least that's true. Uh, in the States. So for uh, four different areas, I'm trying to maintain. So the gray color means that uh, this is the past research. And the uh, you know, uh, blue color uh, means that that's something that uh, we are trying to do these days. For disinfection, uh, we are really working on catalytic membranes these days. I've been working a lot on environmental implication and application of nanomaterials. And that's the today's presentation. As we were working on the nanomaterial, we started to go down a little bit smaller. And of course, I'm not a person who created a single atom catalyst. I'm a person who is applying uh, that for water treatment. And another, my research major has been photoluminescence and photocatalytic uh, uh, materials. And uh, more recently, I've been doing some dye sensitized and photothermal solar disinfection. And I'm going to talk a little about the hydrogen peroxide later. So for the next few slides, as I said, I'm going to give you some introduction because I don't want to give you an impression that uh, single atom research is the one that I've been doing every day. 
So um, let's say uh, we'll start first with the membrane. Uh, some of you have heard that we use membrane for water treatment. Uh, it's a physical sieving. So if you have uh, microorganisms, it's going to get rejected by uh, uh, the size of the pore and size exclusion. So we were thinking about uh, uh, applying. We were uh, we are aware 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 of the situation. The membranes sometimes get damaged during manufacturing or application. So what do you do if your membranes get uh, broken? or has a hole. I mean, this is a pretty common uh, problem in the real world application. And uh, the one, uh, the, the figure that you are looking at now is called hollow fiber. It's called, it's like a long macaroni. Uh, it's inside is uh, a pore, inside is like hollow. And you see the upper right corner, uh, you see a membrane with a certain damage, okay? So how do we fix it? If you have uh, millions and millions of fibers in one system, it is not easy to locate. So the idea here is to send out a certain material. Um, it's pretty simple. It's a chitosan agglomerate, and they do a preferential flow into the, uh, the damage site because there's more drag. And then we send out a little bit of glutaraldehyde that you do up in poor uh, 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 healing. I'm sure you have seen uh, this um, Band-Aid, like a liquid that you can uh, buy at the pharmacy. So it's just like that, it's a glue, okay? Uh, that heals it. Um, I can talk about this more later, but uh, this somehow works pretty well. And uh, the, the company, uh, the people are in, uh, companies are interested in licensing this, not only for um, um, the in-situ healing, but they can they use this for you know QA QC of their new membranes too. So we call it in situ healing using nano band aid. That sounds cool. Uh, nano band aid sounds cool. So that's the uh, why we are calling it. But uh, you know in situ healing means that you have to stop the process and you have to uh, you know um, add something uh, which is an additional step. So I've been dreaming about self healing membrane. I bet some of you in the material science have been working on self-healing. There are just tons of different self-healing chemistry. Uh, but a lot of chemistry that happens uh, is not compatible with the water uh, aqueous environment because a lot of things that uh, you know it's not uh, solvent are not compatible. Okay. So what uh, uh, we uh, did the first generation is many years ago. We did a micro capsule. Inside, you can uh, add different type of isocyanate and with a different functionality, you get the different, uh, you know, reactivity. So basically, they form, uh, you know, they, uh, they are super glue and the capsule is broken, they release isocyanate and then that heals the damage site. Make sense? So, um, so we call it self-healing, uh, you know, uh, uh, capsule embedded membrane. So this was at least conceptually the first a water filtration membrane uh, that can self-heal uh, when it is locally damaged. Okay? But uh, if you are dealing with this chemistry, it is not easy to make this polyurethane capsule micro sphere, uh, micro uh, capsule. Uh, the shelf life is not that long. Water will eventually diffuse into. So we have um, another uh, you know, self-healing system based on microvascular network. I'm sure you have seen that it's a very common self-healing uh, for structural material. So we have another paper. But the one that I really like is this one. So what we do is we start with uh, a, a porous uh, a scaffold, okay? We can start with a PVDF for polypropylene. So you have um, a micropores uh, scaffold and then you start to cross-link the hydrogel inside, okay? So let's imagine that your hydrogel is confined in a pore, they want to expand, but it is cross-linked to the backbone, okay? The hydrogel itself is a filtration layer, okay? And also when membrane is broken, they start to expand and they fill up. So the image that you see in the bottom is that you poke the membrane and it just heals back. You get damage on other side, you get expanded. So this is some sort of like in true hydrogel, um, you know, true self-filling membrane uh, where we um, um, fill the pore with a hydrogel. And as you can imagine, hydrogel will give a lot of hydraulic resistance. So our 
uh, another uh, the more advanced paper uh, material that we published was uh, you know filling the hydrogel asymmetric way on one side of the membrane so that you uh, increase the water permeation. Um, again, I can talk about this later, but I'm just giving you some uh, you know background about some of the work that we have done. Not sure if you heard about solar disinfection, so this, okay? Um, so this is just putting a water in a bottle. I'm looking at, uh, look at this bottle that I'm holding now. So there are a lot of plastic bottles out there uh, in developing countries and you put the water and you leave it under the sun and you wait for a few days, okay? 24 hours to like 72 hours under the sun and then solar you know, radiation kills the germ. So that's the like, bottom line, uh, you know, way to uh, secure the biological safety of water. That's cool, but, you know, as you can imagine, you know, no one wants to wait for a few days uh, until it gets disinfected, okay? So uh, the idea here is um, like uh, using a dye. I'm sure many mature scientists know about dye sensitized solar cell. Okay, you use a dye to capture light, okay? So uh, basically the same, so we use a chromophore, okay? And then this uh, dye accept uh, photons and uh, they, uh, depending on the dye, you can actually transfer the absorbed energy to triplet state oxygen and then it forms a single oxygen. And single oxygen is uh, in fact extremely useful because it is really good at killing viruses. Uh, it is a, in, in some in some sense it's better than uh, other oxidant because it's not uh, you know non-selective. If uh, things like chlorine, uh, they can react with many of many other things, but single action is pretty benign in killing uh, uh, viruses. So here is the idea. Okay, if you add a dye, all right, and uh, it produces single action. The problem with the dye is that it photobleaches over time. And that's the reason when you are doing dye sensitized solar cell, you attach the dye to the substrate to, uh, you know, and also you use a very strong, uh, you know, um, photosensitizer such as PCDM, like the fullerin based, because they are very stable. How about a dye that changes the color? Uh, they just decay over time. So what you are looking at is now erythrocin. Erythrocin is the dye that you drink every day. If you just go out and buy anything pinky, it contains erythrocin. So you are already consuming it. But the erythrocin uh, uh, decays over time within about 20 minutes of time scale under the sunlight. In Singapore sunlight, we are talking about very fast, okay? So now uh, imagine this, you have a bottle of water, okay? In the middle of nowhere, you add a little dye, it becomes pinky. Okay, but in 20 minutes, it becomes transparent. What does that mean? Your water is ready to drink because it killed the drum. And the reason why we can say that is because uh, that's how this graph is telling you that we uh, now can correlate how much dye decays is uh, you know, uh, relevant, uh, proportional to how much singlet action is produced. And if there's a single action production, that it kills the drum. Okay, so, so it's just, if we call it, uh, edible dye set enhanced solar um, water uh, disinfection with a safety indication. And safety indication is extremely important because if you think about just solar disinfection, you never know when the water is, re water is ready to drink, right? So it is so much better to give a third visual inter um, indication. So we started with this concept and now we have moved to um, like solar disinfection window unit that uh, school of Architecture is incorporating into their micro house. So uh, we even did a demonstration in Nairobi, uh, Kenya. And so the problem is that this research virtually stopped over past like two and a half years because of pandemic. But anyhow, so this is something that uh, you know, uh, we have moved to the field scale, which is pretty fun. You may say that, hey, Jell, you know, every erythrocin is, even though it is just really everywhere in the world, it may not be ideal in the middle of nowhere. So can you do the same, same thing by natural plant? Yeah, I mean, it is, this is a cool idea that we say farm to tap solar water disinfection. You will just propose a few simple extraction method to get chromophores from the plant and you add it to the water and they do photosensitization, okay? 
So if you have a, and the curcumin is, ex, is ex, actually extremely uh, you know, interesting for everybody in Southeast Asia. You guys are eating curcumin every day, you know, curries and a lot of you know, flavor uh, stuff. Okay. Um, and of course, uh, you know, there are many other ways to utilize sunlight. We've been working a lot on the photoluminescence and also photocatalysis, but um, I've been working also with Naomi Haulas at RISE for some photothermal uh, plasma resonance um, of, of uh, particles. And uh, so this is uh, you know, on one way, basically the idea is using the sunlight to not raise the temperature of the water, but uh, bring the microorganisms near to the surface and fry them by the heat, uh, localized heat, okay, by surface plasma resonance. All right, so I've been working a lot on hydrogen peroxide uh, synthesis. I have uh, one PhD graduate, another PhD is working on the longevity. So idea is hydrogen peroxide synthesis is actually pretty mature field by a lot of chemists and uh, chemical engineers and material scientists. They've been come up with, coming up with so many different catalysts. I don't mean to compete with them. So, but what we are doing now is applying this hydrogen peroxide synthesis cell in wastewater and uh, just groundwater and et cetera. And we are looking at their chemistry, uh, especially over long-term operation. One thing that I found very interesting is that I have seen so many amazing electrochemistry work out there, uh, amazing catalyst. Uh, but if as soon as you start to apply that to water, uh, your water to treatment scenario, they fail uh, because there are so many uh, you know, species that uh, you know, we do not uh, uh, test in a uh, controlled lab environment, okay? So if you, for example, if you do all these electrochemical reactions in sodium uh, sulfate, uh, and then you start to do that in uh, groundwater, it's going to fail because of the, the other uh, in, uh, you know, uh, solutes. So anyhow, the, the idea here is to produce hydrogen peroxide. And you may say like, you know, no, this is not for, uh, you know, uh, fuel. Okay, so some people think hydrogen fuel, uh, hydrogen, hydrogen peroxide, as an alternative liquid fuel than uh, you know compared to others because it's not very difficult to store. Uh, the efficiency is pretty high, and some of the recent papers are talking about like forty percent uh, efficiency. But uh, you know, our goal is to produce very small amount of hydrogen peroxide because we use that for water treatment. Um, using hydrogen peroxide, uh, we activate the catalyst, uh, activate hydrogen peroxide to hydroxyl radical. And hydroxyl radical based oxidation is called advanced oxidation. So you just need to produce a certain sufficient amount of hydrogen peroxide from dirty water for over a long time. And then you do advanced oxidation. And this is one uh, example of the you know, catalytic membrane. So it start with a ceramic membrane substrate and we add iron oxide chloride catalyst. So um, this is a catalyst that activate hydrogen peroxide to produce uh, OH radical. So um, I just gave a talk uh, about this at uh, you know, international, Singapore International Water Weeks Conference and where I am actually now. But anyhow, so we are now reaching to a stage that we have a single uh, pass membrane and you just pass the water with hydrogen peroxide we are talking about 90% um, destruction of the most pollutants, including background organic matter uh, in a single pass. Uh, we are talking about reaching the flux of up to ultra filtration membrane. So why do we do this? Because if you think about water treatment in the past, it was like pretty equipment, uh, uh, you know, heavy, uh, you know, infrastructure, heavy industry. I think it will go on. And Singapore has been doing really well in recycling uh, wastewater and seawater for drinking water purpose. That's great. But at some point, uh, you know, we are making, uh, you know, things will become a lot more modular and smaller scale. And basically what I'm imagining now, uh, of course, there are so many people working on the membrane, but I'm talking about very small scale system. You don't need to add chemical. It is either driven by, uh, is, you know, just catalytic or electrochemistry you produce uh, precursor chemical and you do pollutant destruction. So uh, that is something that uh, uh, we are envisioning now uh, as a future. 
I guess I'm talking too much in this background. I, uh, I guess a sacrifice of my major research subject. So I'm going to just go through a small, uh, pretty fast. This is uh, interesting material that we worked on recently. Uh, it's a uh, microporous uh, silica shell. We add uh, different catalysts inside, but uh, this was, a, I think, a very interesting paper because this was the first incident of like putting uh, different sh uh, shapes of nanoparticles and even more than one nanoparticles inside the capsule system. And why do we play uh, Why do environmental engineers do this? Because uh, we are talking about over time um, uh, sensing. So uh, the uh, idea here is that you have a certain pollutant and concentration is really low. You oftentimes you need a sort of, some sort of concentration step. So the idea here is that you put the sensor inside in a beaker, you leave it long, you automatically uh, somehow autonomously concentrate that inside the capsule and then it gives a surface signal, okay? So surface enhanced Raman signal. So that's the idea. All right, so um, I have gone through a few slides. I just realized I've been talking too much about other things, but now this is the future presentation. Um, I will try my best to go through, but uh, um, hope you don't mind, um, you know, uh, staying slightly longer to have more discussion. Okay, so so the reason why um, uh, maybe I can uh, shorten down this portion uh, since you guys know much about the nano particle. So this is the reason why I've been talking about nano for the past 20 years. Yeah, nano is great because it's so much has so much surface, more surface area. But at the same time, uh, at the, a certain size limit, you start to have a very interesting uh, catalytic properties and surface properties. That's good. Uh, but then if you go down to a single atom, that is amazing because it's the cost is not going to be concerned anymore. Actually, this is a, a pretty interesting uh, deba uh, debate point because uh, there are like a school of people saying that, hey, let's just do not ever use palladium, platinum, gold. We can just do everything using carbon and boron and nitrogen, okay? Uh, I'm not a chemist, I'm not a material scientist. I don't believe it, okay? There is a reason why palladium and platinum and other you know, catalysts are so good. I mean, you, know, you just you can, you can do a lot with a deep you know? So anyhow, uh, if we can really uh, you know, control this material at a single atom limit, then maybe you know, uh, there's not too much motivation to worry about the cost of these uh, noble metals. Um, anyhow, um, uh, so single atom is oftentimes uh, uh, discussed uh, as uh, somewhere in between heterogeneous catalyst and homogeneous catalyst. And um, I'm not sure if you heard about this debate, a lot of catalysts, when the hardcore catalysts, especially those who work on the homogeneous catalyst, they hate the term single atom, okay? So they intentionally use the term atomically dispersed catalyst or isolated catalyst. And the confusion comes from that a lot of homogeneous catalysts, organometallic uh, catalysts are basically single atom catalysts. Uh, so that's a uh, uh, you know, major reason. And I cannot tell you about one of the journal, the, uh, no, not ACS, but anyhow, one of the journal, they are, they are talking that they want to ban the term single atom catalyst. Well, again, I, I continue to use the single atom catalyst because that's what most people use. A lot of high impact paper come with a single atom uh, terminology. So I, I don't care about their fight. I will uh, just remain low and use the single atom term. So if you have any complaint about my title, uh, we can chat later, okay? So anyhow, you heard about this 100% atomic efficiency, strong uh, metal support interaction, and uh, unsaturated coordination. But now uh, it, a lot of people are uh, starting to uh, you know, control the coordination number and co coordination room. That's uh, something that uh, is very beneficial compared to the bulk cluster. So. Uh, why people like me are interested in. So we've been uh, just following up a lot of literature and there are so many high impact papers coming out in Science, Nature, Jackson, all, all these papers uh, talking about this single atom about past 10 years. Um, and um, they are talking about uh, more efficient hydrogen evolution, oxygen reduction, CO2 reduction. Of course, that, those are the things that, uh, you know, uh, half of the chemists and material scientists are working, which is great. 
but then you know if you think about this enhanced efficiency that is not very exciting to be honest okay how many papers have you seen that they say uh, yeah my catalyst is has a 20 more uh, percent higher efficiency or 50 percent higher efficiency there are just tons of papers like that and the enhanced efficiency is just like okay that's great but it's not too exciting um, um, there are, uh, also that much enhanced efficiency may not mean much at all for water treatment uh, because major limitation in water treatment in a catalytic or physical separation comes from the fact that it has just so many other things in the water. Okay, so the, your catalyst get, will get foul. There are so many other side frictions. And if you have a membrane, you know, your membrane is not only removing salt, but it has to remove salt or rest of the stuff in the water. So uh, the increasing the efficiency by 10, 20, 30 percent doesn't mean much. But what, what I was really excited is this selectivity. So this is a one example in the lower, lower right corner. So somebody was just doing this experiment of palladium nanoparticle burlesque versus, versus palladium single atom. So if you are doing a hydrogenation using palladium nanoparticle, one, once you start with a one three buta diene, so a two double bond, it became becomes butane. Why? Because you know, if they say it get over hydration. But then uh, if they use a uh, single uh, atom uh, palladium, they, it becomes butene, okay? So why? Because uh, it's a, a somewhat size limited. Okay, very, very primitive way of explaining this is that uh, nanoparticles are too big, a uh, single atom is more selective. Okay, so now that is kind of a, a ringing a bell in, uh, uh, in uh, environmental engineers, why? because we are stuck with that kind of situation a lot. Let's imagine a wastewater, okay? You have all sorts of different organic compounds like, you know, uh, human excretion, plant, animal, uh, you know, biological stuff. They are okay, to be honest. And then if they go to the nature, they uh, can get easily degraded. They contribute to the oxygen demand, but they are not necessarily pollutant, okay? That destroy the nature. What are the things that destroy nature and becomes a problem? For example, something that has a carbon chlorine bond, carbon bromine bond, or carbon fluorine bond. Carbon fluorine bond is something that you know very well, PFAS, okay? Uh, Perfluorino, uh, you know, a uh, 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 compound that has a lot of carbon fluorine bond. The DBP, disinfection byproduct, is a very common compound uh, coming out of the water treatment plant that contains carbon chlorine, carbon bromine. And uh, this carbon halogen bond is not natural. Uh, you know, they didn't exist. It is a, usually a man-made chemical. So uh, the interesting question is, okay, you have this whole organic compounds in your very complex water matrix. Can you find a way to just destroy carbon halogen bond? Okay, so that means selectivity. That means very high efficiency. That, that doesn't sound doable, but if we can do it, that would be interesting. Of course, you know, there are multiple different steps to uh, you know, do, a, do the pretreatment. But again, the idea is in the complex matrix, can you do a, some sort of selective reaction? That's the question, okay? So do you agree that I'm an environmental engineer sitting in the reading papers and people are saying, hey, hey, if you use some single atom, you sometimes see this extraordinary selectivity in certain reaction, okay? Sounds cool, okay? So that's the reason why I stepped into single atom research about four years ago. So um, one important thing is that I don't wanna get into complex synthesis method, okay? I want something simple, right? So good news is that there are many different ways to do single atom synthesis, but it seems like some of the methods were really easy for those who are familiar with the nanoparticle synthesis. So this is what we decided to at the beginning. So the, for example, starting with a certain substrate such as silicon carbide or other you know, metal oxide species, you start with a uh, you know, certain linker molecule and then you add a palladium precursor. So they get bound to the surface uh, uh, because of electrostatic attraction. 
And then, then you do a reduction, okay? You can do different ways. Um, you can uh, do a chemical reduction, uh, so, uh, sodium borohydrate or ascorbic acid. I'm sure you heard about this if you do any metal synthesis, or you can do a nice UVC uh, with a very controlled uh, you know, irradiation. So this is like a cooking, all right? So let's say that I came to Singapore and I learned about getting some, uh, certain uh, fried rice and I got the recipe and I go back home and I do it, I guarantee that the taste is different, right? <laughs> so I'm sure you know that, right? So uh, for this simple method, my students, students struggled a lot. It's just like a little bit delicate here and there, okay? But anyhow, the reason why I've been doing this based on uh, my friend's uh, computation or simulation by linking APTMS, you give a certain basic uh, scaffold where you can uh, separate the single atom, okay? Uh, so starting with that, this is our first publication in 2018, already four years ago. Now you can, you're going to laugh at me because our STEM image was horrible at the time. We got it from Brookhaven that time. So STEM image was pretty questionable and X-ray was okay, okay? But at least that time it was a, a platinum loading up to 1.6%. And that was pretty close to highest weight, weight percent loading. The reason why we did, did that is because um, uh, I read a paper about platinum nanoparticle on single atom uh, on the silicon carbide for PFAS degradation. Okay, this is a perfluorooctanoic acid with a bunch of uh, fluorine, carbon fluorine. So as I said, okay, somebody reported um, very recently at the time platinum nanoparticle on silicon carbide and they have some activity toward uh, PFOA, okay? So I said, all right. And I just read a paper in uh, Science and Nature or whatever they were talking about single atom. So we struggled a little bit to make the single atom catalyst. And we found that the efficiency is so much faster okay, with a single atom. And our hypothesis is that you need a proton, okay, you need a hydrogen, right? Because you need to substitute with a um, fluorine so hydrogen comes into onto the catalyst, they have to spill over to the substrate. And our hypothesis, by the way, this is photocatalysis, we are not doing uh, hydrogen gas bubbling, is that the, the proton spillover to the substrate must be faster. We didn't prove the hypothesis, okay? We were not sure, uh, we just reported and um, the efficiency was pretty good. I mean, that was the fact, you know, so uh, at the, in the, within the ACS catalysis, there was about the time many papers started to come in, at least in terms of the functionality. This was really interesting observation because by just loading platinum as a single atom, uh, your efficiency got improved very, very much. Okay, we are very excited. And compared to other method to destroy this type of compound, this is a lot more energy efficient, which is great. What was really interesting to me is that I'm not sure if you know the Brookhaven National Lab is a DOE lab in the United States. Uh, this, they have the world's largest synchrotron source and they do a lot of physics work uh, as you can imagine. So our work was um, um, selected as a top 10, one of the top 10 achievement by the physicist. It was like, cool. And this is my initial reaction. Wow, single atom catalysis means, seems like a big deal, okay? Uh, that time still, I did. I was not into single atom. I was like checking out. So for the, a lot of students listening to my talk, this is sometimes how the faculty start a new area. Okay, they, it takes time to just taste a little bit and they start to try this and try that and then we move on, okay? Uh, I still do not call myself as the single atom expert. We are still learning. There's so many interesting things to do. So, okay, what do you do if you're a professor? You call your friends, uh, you now call your students. Hey, hey, guys, get together. Okay, so I told him, told him. Okay, so what do we do? Uh, let's see if there is anything that we can do based on what we have been doing. Okay, so that's how we selected uh, a few subject for the study for the next couple of years. So uh, these are the main three things that uh, that we studied. Okay, the first one. Since we did the platinum, now we did the palladium too, all right? 
So uh, we did a palladium on different types of substrate. Now you can see that our STEM image is so much better, right? So we started to get the better images and people are doing, I mean, of course we didn't do, we borrowed the machine. But anyhow, what was really interesting to me is that we now uh, added, uh, you know, more plat uh, palladium on a single atom as a single atom. But once you reach a certain stage, uh, before you make a complete cluster, you know, you can now see a crystalline cluster. This looks strange. Uh, it's just like it's people these days call ensemble or, you know, a neighboring single atom. So this looked strange. So what I said to my student, hey, you know, this looks wrong. So can you go back? And we got the same image. And by the time that we got the same, it takes time to get the stem image, okay? Because we don't have a stem. Uh, it takes time, but then by the time we saw and confirmed that this is true, somebody just published a paper in Nature somewhere that this they called it neighboring single atom. So I said like, okay, so we are screwed because somebody already published, but at the same time, we felt relieved that what we are observing is not wrong. Okay, so that's good news. So I'm going to just skip all these X-ray studies. So we do a very detailed X-ray study to make sure they are not, uh, you know, there's no dominant palladium palladium bonding. And also we can uh, do the similar thing for the platinum too, not only the palladium, okay? So what is really interesting is now that we start with the four chlorophenol. Why four chlorophenol? Because that's the simplest molecule that we can play with uh, that has a carbon chlorine bond. And uh, now you can see in the red color, here, the degradation kinetics is so fast. We're just like, boom, gone. Uh, but it's so much better when you reach a certain um, you know, uh, dosage of the palladium on the substrate uh, that we call somewhat neighboring, okay? What's most interesting to me is this. When you are reducing this chlorophenol, okay, with hydrogen gas, okay, uh, you get 100% recovery of chlorine without touching the rest of the molecule. If you do a nanoparticle, what happens is that they start to attack uh, you know, hydrogen there, uh, oxygen here and also wing, okay? So your efficiency drops completely. Your selectivity drops, okay? Uh, about like 60%, but somehow when you use single atom, all your hydrogen is used to break carbon chlorine. Do you remember when I said, hey, I want to come up with something that just break carbon chlorine without touching anything, okay? So this is a pretty interesting indication. Something is happening, okay? So we did a lot of other experiments. I'm selecting, showing some. So if you have two, the pollutant with the two chlorine, it's very famous pollutant 2,4-D or trichlorophenol. So, as soon as we use uh, this single atom in a neighboring configuration, they somehow just attack carbon chlorine, which is strange, right? Well, strangely good. Okay, so what do you do if you do not understand the mechanism? Okay, we do a few studies, uh, thermodynam thermodynamically it does not make much sense. So I call my friend who is a computational people, a computational chemist, so we did a very extensive computational uh, simulation to see why this is happening. And for time's sake, I'm going to skip. How about the brominated compound? Yeah, we see the same thing. Uh, and now, uh, depending on how, so we got improved all in the synthesis method. So now we can um, produce uh, the platinum with a you know, different coordination number. And depending on the coordination number, somehow, the, the uh, you know, photocatalysis uh, is not uh, very dependent on uh, the, the coordination number, but uh, you know, thermal catalysis is. So anyhow, what I'm trying to say is that, uh, yes, for carbon bromine bond, we have a pretty similar uh, under, uh, you know, observation that this type of material again to, can do something that nanomaterials cannot do, which is, again, very encouraging to people like me uh, who is doing environmental engineering. All right, the second topic, okay. Um, so I just told you a little bit about hydrogen peroxide synthesis. So we do oxygen reduction, okay. You can do it 
photochemically or mostly electrochemically, right? So you have to uh, do an oxygen reduction and for oxygen reduction, uh, you can use many various different type of material. Carbon is pretty commonly used or carbon nitride. Um, but what a school of researchers use uh, catalysts such as anthraquinone. Okay. Why anthraquinone? Because industrial scale, large scale uh, hydrogen peroxide synthesis, they use anthraquinone as a main catalyst okay, at high elevated temperature and the solvent. Okay. It's not environmentally sustainable. So there are a lot of people trying to use uh, different chemistry, as I said, notably electrochemical method. But you, is, the efficiency becomes better for this oxygen reduction to, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, hydrogen peroxide instead of like, you know, um, you know, uh, water, right? So, um, uh, so you need this. So, uh, but then electron has to come from somewhere if it is not electrochemistry. Okay, so. For example, you need to oxidize water uh, to oxygen, okay? But then uh, this catalyst such as cobalt nanoparticle is something that have been widely used, okay? But uh, um, so here is the problem, okay? You understand, right? You need reduction catalyst for hydrogen peroxide synthesis uh, for oxygen reduction. And you may need uh, the catalyst for water oxidation, okay? Water oxidation catalyst. So let's imagine a certain uh, material that you are trying to put two co-catalysts, okay? But then if they are touching each other, the co-catalyst for oxidation and co-catalyst for reduction, they may cancel out, okay? And I didn't know this is a common problem. Uh, so we already had uh, the anthraquinone catalyst uh, for electrochemical hydrogen peroxide synthesis, uh, also photochemical synthesis. That was our previous work. And now we are thinking about uh, the single atom and we started to think about loading two catalysts at the same time. And there are just so many uh, papers out there talking about a strategy to physically separate co-catalyst. So one example here is this core shell structure. Uh, they put reduction co-catalyst outside the shell and oxidation co-catalyst inside the shell. So they are physically separated, so they do not cancel out, right? And there are just so many beautiful papers out there, okay? If you just go out the literature, uh, there are so many interesting and beautiful structures that separate these two catalysts. So uh, that's good, okay? Again, I don't wanna compete with them, but our idea is this, okay? So this is an anthraquinone co-catalyst. Uh, so we start with a, a carbon nitride, so at the end of this uh, carbon nitride etch, we are going to anchor this uh, anthraquinone uh, co-catalyst outside only because that's where the anchors are, nitrogen anchors. Now we are trying to reduce cobalt, um, uh, but we are trying to do it in a single atom configuration. So there is this you know, carbon nitride pole uh, surrounded by this heptazine uh, you know, ring. So now you, uh, if there's a nitrogen, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, 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 that can chelate onto the metal, right? So in this uh, reduction center, we put uh, cobalt like this as a single atom. If you place cobalt as a nanoparticle, they may sit and they may cancel each other. But if it is a single atom, there's a, you know, basically a certain separation from the edge to the hole, okay? at least a couple of angstrom, it just cannot combine, right? So the idea is by using this base uh, in a scaffold, there, uh, this physical separation is enabled by uh, the fact that cobalt is linked onto uh, the uh, carbon nitride as a single atom. As I said, why did we do this? Because we already had carbon nitride material that is linked with the anthraquinone for other purposes. Okay, so that's cool. And so we, uh, this is on uh, data. Uh, so let's say oxygen evolution from water oxidation. Of course, you can enhance by adding cobalt single atom. Uh, and also you can uh, enhance the uh, hydrogen peroxide for the same reason uh, by adding cobalt single atom or anthraquinone. But the good news is that we add both 
and they are additive. The additive meaning, so the reduction catalyst and oxidation catalyst never canceled each other. So, and that's the beauty okay, uh, of this uh, design. They did not cancel out by touching each other. So, okay, cool. We just um, had an interesting work. We published it, okay? And so um, I think it was PNAS and somebody wrote a paper about our paper and I almost had a heart attack because I was worried whether this chemist may have a nasty comment about our work, you know what I mean? But this person, uh, I, don't, I don't even know this person. I think she's uh, uh, the chemist said, although this um, cobalt anthraquinone carbon nitride platform looks significantly simpler than the reaction center proteins in natural photosynthesis. It remarkably overcome the hurdle of charge recombination and exciton split and achieved reaction selectivity. Okay, this is cool, right? So this is how I felt like I was really worried at the beginning and then like after reading, yes, good, okay? So this is actually a really important lesson for me because um, I didn't know the meaning of what we are doing. Right, so I was just stuck with hydrogen peroxide synthesis, and I was thinking about just writing a cool paper with a single atom. But I almost feel like I could have published uh, in a better journal if I had this kind of insight: how to link this structure to biological system, uh, and you know maybe a couple more experiment. So uh, if any students are listening to uh, this talk. And this was a lesson for me. Like, yeah, I should have talked to colleagues outside and they could have uh, guided me to uh, make a more meaning of uh, some of the, our work. All right, so the third topic is uh, facet specific single atom loading onto TiO2, okay? As I said, you know, uh, I had to start with something that we did and this is what we did in the past. In 2015, we made a different type of TiO2 material and we used it for, you know, uh, we look at how the facet controls, uh, you know, uh, energy transfer uh, for two applications. The first one is a disacetide solar cell and second one was for water treatment, okay? And we did a, in collaboration, we did a very, uh, you know, fundamental uh, experimental and computational study. So we published this paper and so we know how to do it. So uh, what we did was that uh, depending on the facet, you have uh, you know, reduction centers and oxidation centers. So through uh, this process, what we did is we loaded uh, you know, a platinum only onto the one facet of um, you know, TiO2 101 facet, okay? So that, that becomes your uh, reduction center, okay? I'm going to skip a little bit. So uh, there are like probably thousands and thousands of papers out there say, hey, my photocatalysis produces more hydroxyl radical and destroy pollutant better than yours, okay? Uh, pretty common in energy field and many other field in my catalyst uh, improves Faraday efficiency by 5% or something like that, right? So uh, electrochemistry too. So anyhow, so um, th this material produces hydroxyl radical a little bit more. So, uh, but so I feel like, yeah, it seems like another photocatalyst with slightly improved kinetics. Uh, it is not exciting anymore, but uh, what is really interesting in one way is that and it is uh, one way to uh, separate the redox centers. It's a very simple design. It's not 100% uh, separation, like more sophisticated, sophisticated material, but by loading, uh, platinum only one one on one facet. So um, majority of reduction happens only on that facet while the oxidation happens on the other uh, zero, zero, 001 facet. So that's a very simple design to separate out the redox centers. All right, so um, I show, have shown you three examples and those are all published, okay? So uh, those are past and uh, I, uh, we are working on many different subjects right now that I look forward to sharing uh, in future. Uh, but our overall hypothesis is that the unique uh, physical, chemical, and electronic properties of single atom catalyst can be exploited to 
more efficient, uh, efficiently catalyze the reactions relevant to water treatment. Okay. And as I said, my interest is in water treatment. I sometimes do, like sometimes like hydrogen peroxide synthesis, and sometimes you feel like it is not related to water treatment, but it is indeed related to the water treatment. And one of the keyword is uh, compared to their nanoparticle counterpart. And I belong to a, a research center funded by National Science Foundation in the United States. The title of the center is nanotechnology enabled water treatment. So I'm kind of one of the generations who built uh, the career studying nanomaterials. Uh, but you know, uh, one another um, you know, claim that I'm trying to make is that I'm not saying the single atom is always the solution. I'm saying that there are some select reactions that are very, very interesting uh, when I compare it to nanoparticles. There are a lot of things to study. Uh, there are so many different metals that we are trying to study. So, so far, our group has been uh, playing with uh, platinum, uh, palladium, uh, cobalt, iron, uh, and etc. So, uh, there are many different substrates that we are working on. We are dominantly working on carbon substrate that I haven't presented. The reason is because we shifted a lot to electrochemical treatment. Uh, we are seeing some of the very, uh, very exciting uh, ways to Synthesize. Usually these days, uh, you know, our main focus is electro deposition and also electrochemical treatment uh, using the single atom. And what is most important for me is what type of reaction we target. I'm not interested in hydrogen evolution or, you know, uh, just regular OR. We are mostly targeting the pollutant degradation. Okay. Uh, one interesting question that we come up again and again is the stability. Okay. Uh, this is something that most uh, high-end, uh, you know, uh, state-of-art research in science and nature not, do not necessarily deal with the material safe, uh, stability over time, especially when they are exposed to complex water matrix. Okay, and there are in my, in my uh, we I believe there are so many interesting applications that I can go forward. Uh, these are the group of students that have been working on a single atom. Uh, and with that, I'm going to uh, finish my uh, presentation. Uh, and thank you so much for your attention. Uh, I talk, uh, feel like I talk too much, but hopefully you enjoyed my presentation. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jae Hong. You are actually right on time, so you didn't go over time. So we have about five minutes for uh, uh, questions. That was a really great talk. So now we are open for questions. So you can either Put your questions in the chat box or you can unmute yourself and directly ask. Yeah, somebody then, said um, Mo Shen, uh, Tom Taji said um, uh, you can do you know, time dependent TFT calculation to invest energy level of excited state. Yeah, so I have some collaboration with Victor Batista at uh, Yale Chemistry. Uh, he did some that of that in our previous work. Uh, I do have a couple of uh, DFT people who help me, but if you are ever doing DFT and you have any computational time left, please give me a call because we have so many problems, uh, so many uh, obs interesting observations. We are always short of the DFT uh, collaboration. I do have a couple of major uh, collaborators, but I'll be very happy to expand collaboration if you, you have ever any extra computational time. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, we see another question from the chat box. So, yeah, so I um, see that, yeah, Zhong, Zhong Xin from uh, chemistry. So stability of uh, SAC is something that uh, we are now investigating a lot. So uh, we have actually seen a case that, uh, let's add um, platinum on a certain uh, in a metal oxide surface. It looks like a single atom. And you take off a uh, you know, stand, and you do x-ray, it looks great, okay? And then you start the reaction, okay? And reaction goes well. And then you look at the material later back and it's not single atom, they migrated. And um, it depends on the anchor and depends on the, of course, the substrate. But I sometimes feel like, yeah, I mean, there are quite a few papers they do not necessarily check the how the material changes over time. Um, uh, but um, I do have a one case 
that is really interesting. Okay, I don't wanna talk about much because we haven't published it, but there is a single atom and it migrates fast and then they come from small clusters, but the small cluster has a better activity than single atom. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that if we do not check that, uh, that chemistry carefully, then we could have already almost write a paper, say, hey, we start with a single atom, great efficiency. But what we found is that really early on, they changed their uh, clustering uh, you know, uh, phenomena. But at the same time, some other single atoms are very stable. They, they do not change over like you know, a couple of months. So I think this is something that uh, uh, is pretty mysterious for me. Uh, it is probably very different in a dry phase because Tons of paper in single atom come from the dry phase, but I don't do dry phase. I do mostly aqueous phase, right? So this is something that, uh, and in, as a field, I think you know something that uh, you know are very interesting to look over time. Um, leaching is the same thing. I mean, there they some sometimes they leach, but when when you have a single atom that is well, you know, anchored onto the substrate or using uh, you know chelating agent. I think they are pretty stable, even more stable than nanoparticle. And now, uh, John Wang raised a hand. Good morning. Hello. Uh, good morning, Professor King. Uh, enjoy your talk this morning. Uh, I, I think we also work on the single atom catalyst in Singapore. I, I just would like to have your comment. Uh, I, I, so, as we understand, you know, we try to put uh, these singles on the surface, but the surface is very complicated. You know, you have a different location, different corner, different edge, or different defects. I, I think I would like to have you comment how can we control these senses in such a way we can get uh, the bond and the coordination for the singles on the surface. Right, I think you know that's a, a million dollar question. But I do one thing that I can again. I haven't done. I haven't done every material in the world. But one thing that, as far as I understand, is your question is so case specific, so substrate specific. Okay, so if you're talking about extremely well uh, controlled carbon nitride versus if you start with a carbon nanotube or graphene oxide or reduced graphene oxide or you know, metal oxide with a, with a very well controlled surface or you know, some amorphous. So depending on the substrate, you know, um, that control is different. Um, my, our group's approach is somewhat uh, you know, random in a sense that we start with a silicon carbide because that's the material that has a certain property. And we migrated to uh, some other metal oxide because we did uh, some, um, you know, photocatalysis. But as of now, we are really working mostly on carbon-based material, and uh, we have that trouble. If you just have a uncontrolled carbon material, we have some, uh, you know, trouble in precisely controlling their surface coverage. So we don't start with a carbon, we start with a, some sort of anchors, okay? And, and I, I can talk to you later, but we haven't published it. So basically you have a certain way to uh, have a dispersed single atom, and then we bind that to uh, the substrate in a, a lot more controlled way, okay? Uh, that's one, one approach. Another approach is, I'm sure you have seen a lot of papers in electrode deposition. It's actually a lot tougher than we originally imagined. We have a lot of trouble duplicating some of the electrochemical deposition method published in Nature Com, other people's work. And, uh, but what we are finding is that we have to do a little bit more extra um, than what's in the paper just because of the reason that you said that you don't know how to control, right? <laughs> so, yeah, I'm Thank not sure if, I, if, I'm, if I'm not sure if I answered your question, but we are struggling with that too. You, you gave a very good answer. I, I believe we needed to create, a, you know, happy marriages. We don't want to create an unhappy marriage on the surface. That's what right, I'm, right. Yeah. So again, you know, you need to have a, some sort of, you know, you just cannot load single atom onto substrate a heterogeneous subtree in a uniform way. You need to have additional step to control that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. Yeah. Enjoy your talk. Thank you.
I think Chen raised his hand. So Chen, please ask a question. Okay. Uh, hi, Prof Kim. Uh, thanks for a nice talk. Uh, I, I have two questions. One is that your uh, photocatalytic synthesis of hydrogen peroxide, it seems like your concentration of hydrogen peroxide is quite low. Uh, is that a concern for uh, your water treatment, uh, you know, in the water treatment application? The second, question, yeah. Yeah, the second question is that uh, when you have hydrogen peroxide, you, uh, in order to kill germs, you have to have uh, 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 OH radicals. And uh, we have been working on this uh, using the, uh, you know, this is a classic Fenton chemistry. Right? We found that if you, sometimes if you create too much, uh, if you break down the hydrogen peroxide too quickly, it doesn't kill germs. Uh, maybe the radicals doesn't doesn't have a chance to find the germs. I don't know if you see the same similar problem. Yeah. Okay. So if you want to produce a very high concentration of hydrogen peroxide, you know there are a lot of research um, out there uh, coming from different field, and um, I think there are, as I said, uh, you know reporting up to like forty percent, and one of the noticeable paper. Was about two years ago from uh, two years ago from rise uh, in science. Uh, they're using the separate cell with an uh, in-between solid state state electrode electrolyte. Like you, do you recognize that work? Uh, How Tian Wang's group? Okay, so you you can get to that. Okay, so that's good. You can concent uh, produce hydrogen peroxide high concentration, uh, but that's not the goal here. And uh, we are talking about like one or two a couple of millimolar hydrogen peroxide concentration for advanced oxidation application. Now, you're talking about disinfection. I don't wanna do disinfection uh, by advanced oxidation, okay? Um, I don't wanna kill the germs by um, you know, advanced oxidation. The reason is because, um, let's say if you have, uh, you're testing with the E. coli, or you know uh, MS2 or PR772. So those are small microorganisms you can easily remove uh, by even for you know uh, E. coli hydrogen peroxide. I uh, know I'm sorry. The OH radical disinfection is too slow to be honest. You can just use chlorine. Uh, when I was talking about this you know this modular system, we are adding uh, you know catalyst uh, heterogeneous phantom like catalyst in a membrane with a molecular weight cutoff of like 300 kilo Dalton, okay? And once you, we have a, this membrane set up, um, what, we are, what we can do is to basically remove most of the particles before the advanced oxidation, okay? Uh, so um, in those kind of system, I'm not too concerned about microorganisms because uh, it's better to, remove them by size exclusion. What I'm more concerned is, for example, pollutant like one for dioxane, okay? It's just impossible to remove uh, without, uh, you know, uh, uh, advanced oxidation. Using even reverse osmosis, you cannot remove it, okay? So more down the stream, imagining groundwater or, you know, uh, in any other system, uh, removing, microorganisms by hydroxyl radical. I have wrote, I have written that paper in the past, but uh, you know, it's not necessarily the best design in my opinion. Okay, cool. Uh, we, can, we can talk about it more, Chan. Okay, it seems like you are in that area. Uh, very exciting. Yes, cool. So uh, we are about running out of time. So there are still some uh, uh, questions in the chat box, but probably we have to end the, today's seminar. And feel free to contact Professor Kim if you have other questions. So I'd like to thank everyone again for attending today's seminar. Uh, thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Thank you.